Hello. Oh, great. thank you. Yay. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to Junior College Planning Night. That's not junior college as in like Mercer. It's, you know, if you're a junior and you're planning to go to college. Okay. So how many of you have um, been through this process before? Show of hands. Ooh, not too many. Okay. How many of you are really nervous about the whole process? Okay, some people are hesitant. Okay, it's not bad, really. It's, um, we help you, we're gonna walk you through it. You're gonna have a full presentation tonight. We're videotaping it, yay. So you'll be able to go back if you wanna sit through it again. Um, we'll also put the slides up on our website and I'll send a link to you uh, through our announcement system. Oh, well let me just go back to that for a second. I love this cartoon, if you can see it. It says, the U.S. News and World Report Guide to America's Top 500 Colleges, Chapter 1. Okay? And Dad's reading it to his little child. And I'll talk to you about U.S. News and World and rankings and all of that, but don't get caught up in all of that, okay? Be smart consumers when you're looking at colleges, and, and I'll explain that. So we have... Um, Ms. Getman and Mr. Devone, who will also be presenting, and we have, um, Ashley, I forget your last name. La France from Kaplan to talk about SAT and ACT testing, which is gonna be a big part of, as you probably know, junior year. So junior college planning is exciting, but can be stressful, all right? Don't, try not to stress out about it, okay? We've been sending kids to college for many, many years. Um, it's, it's not, a horrible thing. Just have to be organized. Um, it's a big decision for your children, right? And so the idea is to pick the right school. Don't pay attention necessarily to name. It's got to be a good fit. That's what we really tried to advocate here. Your children are going to go off, become independent, gain a lot of confidence in themselves. You know, it's young adulthood. They're entering young adulthood. Your senior year next year is going to be tough because you're going to be loving your children and knowing they're leaving and, and really you know, dreading that, but at the same time, by mid-year of senior year, you're gonna be like, oh my God, I can't wait for you to go. And the same thing is gonna be true of your kids. They're gonna be like, mom, stop. And then they're gonna be, oh my God, I love you, I don't wanna go. So there's a lot that, you know, lots of ups and downs. Um, also, it's a good, t it's a time for them to start looking at a career, right? That's where they're gonna pick their majors based on this. Uh, some students know immediately what they want to do. I knew when I was this high, I set up my stuffed animals and started teaching them. And I would bribe my dog with cheese and say, sit, and, you know, and so I could teach them. I wasn't even in school yet, and I knew I had to be in education. And um, it's time to organize and plan the journey, and that's why we're here to help you. So let's start with college. It's a business, okay? Some people get very bedazzled by the names, by the process, oh my God, I have to get into this school. Really, it's a business. And US News and World Report has fed into this insanity. Okay, we call it the swimsuit issue when they put you know, the top colleges in America. Um, their rankings are done by colleges ranking each other, okay, by SAT scores. Um, by the school's reputation, not necessarily by the best graduation rate or the best job placement. Okay, these colleges will play games. For example, job placement, you say, oh, they have a 90% job placement. Where do they place these students? At their university. That's not what you want, okay? Also, the average graduation rate, does anyone know what that is? How long it takes kids to get through school? Six years, yes, even the, um, the government has a report card and it's six years. That does not have to be, okay? That means more money out of your pockets. No need. They can make it in four years. So we're going to show you um, a little trick on how to compare schools to each other. And um, you'll see they, even this form that all the colleges fill out talk about it within six years, but that does not have to happen, okay? Here's a, here's a trick that they play. I'll tell you, Tufts has something called four plus one. Anyone hear about that program? Oh, that's a great one. You come in the first year and they advocate a gap year, which I love, gap years are great, but not for the kind of money Tufts is gonna charge you for the gap year, okay? That's like 40,000. And they don't count that gap year toward the four years the student has to be in school. So you're in for five. So do the math, that's a lot of money. No need, okay? So really, if you're well-planned and, and you're doing a good job, you can get out in four years. So look at that when you're looking at schools. Also, um, what's important is selectivity. That's the percentage of 
um, students who are offered admission and the yield, the percentage of admitted students who enroll. Now, how many of your uh, children have taken the PSAT? Yes, all right, because we give it here. Good, I'm glad they sat. How many of you have mailboxes that are stuffed with brochures from colleges? Okay, why? The, your child checked, yes, please send me more information. They take aggregate scores. The colleges buy these scores, and before you know it, Mom, Yale wants me. They sent me this marketing piece. And it's, no, Yale is doing that, or the Ivies do this, because they want you to apply, because that means many, many, many students apply, but they only take these many. All right, so again, that's a ranking portion, right? So that makes them look good. So just, you know, be savvy about this, right? Really research it. Put as much time into this as you put into buying a car and understand it is a business. They're there to make money, and their bond ratings depend on this. So they can't borrow unless, you know, they have high rankings, because people look at that. Some colleges don't want to participate in the rankings, but U.S. News and World will rank them anyway. So, you know, it's, it's, something, it's a place to start if you want to look, but don't base it on that visit. And, and we'll talk more about I know I'm stealing your thunder. I'm sorry. Um, okay. This is an interesting thing. This is from NACAC, the National Association of College Admissions Counselors. And they do a poll every two years for all colleges, public, private, et cetera. The top four factors that colleges look for, and, and you'll get this on the website, is grades in college prep classes, right? So they should be good. Uh, grades in all courses. Strength of curriculum, what does that mean? That means um, we offer APs and honors, and if your child is up to it and takes those courses, great. But if you have a child who's pulling a 99 in college prep courses and never once tried an honors class, then they look at it and say, hmm, the school offered this, you really do qualify for this, why aren't you taking it? So they look at all those factors. And then the fourth is admissions test scores, SAT and ACTs. And then we can go down, then it's the essay, council recommendation, demonstrated interest. Are you guys going to talk about demonstrated interest? Yes. Yes, okay, good. All right, and we'll talk about, that's a really interesting thing too. So this is a nice thing to take a look at. There's a trophy admission system, which we don't advocate for. It's going Ivy, you win. A safety school is a loss. And we don't even call them safety anymore. We call them probable, because it's, it's competitive. Um, the trophy emphasizes how few get in versus what's, you know, versus the best fit, which is finding a school that fits your child's personality. The last thing you want is to send your child, and students, you listen, how many students are here? Oh, great, yeah, okay, good. The last thing you want is to send your child and students and going to a school, and you've worked hard to get into your dream school, you think, and you get in there, and you're like, oh, my God, I can't stand it here. And what's going to happen? You're going to leave. And that money is whoosh, down the drain. And what, you come back, you say, send me my transcripts. I have to transfer to another college. That's sad. Don't, don't let that happen. So really sift through it. Go to the campus. Mm, I'm doing it this again. This is my part. Yeah, I know. Um, she'll talk about what turn. I know. I can't stop. Okay. All right. So anyhow, best fit. Really look for the best fit. Some quick facts real, real fast. Transfer is the new normal. Okay. So 42% of all students transfer at some point. That means they've gone, they're going to a school, they don't like it, they transfer to another one. This also takes into account kids who go to um, community colleges, which is a really good deal, and then they transfer to a four-year school, okay? Um, top factors in transfers are GPA at the post-secondary institution and average grades in transferable courses. Now, good, uh, good news for students who go to community college in New Jersey, transferring is easy. They mostly take all the credits. We have something called New Jersey Transfer, and all the schools uh, have articulation agreements. And let me tell you, if sometimes community college is great. Maybe you want to stay at home, guys, and you, know, you don't want to spend a lot of money, parents. Community college is a wonderful option. You do your two years, because let's face it, the first two years are pretty much the basics anyway, unless you're going into engineering or nursing or a very specified course of study. So you do your basics, and then you move to a four-year where you can really delve into your major. Why pay more for something at a four-year school when you're getting the same thing at a community college? I just send that out to you 
and it's really good. Application costs are expensive. We try to encourage you not to apply to 20 schools, to keep it at a maximum of six, okay? And we'll, they'll talk about the different uh, categories for that. So you can see an average college application is $45. It's expensive. Look at all the colleges and universities. There are 3,300, okay? You will get into a school. All right, the biggest thing is, oh my God, I won't get in. You will. And I have to just tell you this quick story about my stepson. I love him to death. I do. We didn't know he was graduating high school until literally his little feet went across the stage because he was failing TV production and he needed this to graduate. He didn't go here. So he graduates, and I thought his GPA was really not good. And he says, guess what? I said, what? He said, I got into the University of Kansas. I said, how'd you do that? He said, I listened to you. They wanted a student from New Jersey. They never get, uh, from Pennsylvania. They never get anybody from Pennsylvania. So it's, dem it's the demographics that helped me get in. Okay, he got in. Needless to say, wasn't a good fit. Okay, Kansas, what's wasn't a good fit. So he ends up dropping out and going to a community college. The boy went to three different schools. You know how many credits he got? Zero. Why? It wasn't for him. College period wasn't for him because he was too young and immature. And we tried to have that talk with him, but he insisted that he go. So that was, you know, you learn, right? So now he's doing some other thing. He's happy. We're happy. But it wasn't a good fit. Also, 80% um, of freshmen attend a four-year college that accepts at least half of the applicants. This is really designed to ease your fears. Your child will get into college if they want to go. Okay, not a question. We, there's also something called a gap year that you can consider between senior year and the first year of college. They take a full year off and do something really interesting. You stop laughing over there, Mrs. Hill. Um, and we're going to have an evening about that in the spring just to educate you about the gap year. Okay, I'm done. I'm going to hand this over <laughs> to Ms. Getman to talk about testing. Um, all right, so just to give you an outline of uh, the rest of the program this evening, Ashley LaFrance is here from Kaplan. She's going to cover the uh, testing component. Um, I'm going to cover the um, college search, uh, finding the right fit. And then um, Mr. Devone, Frank Devone, will be covering family connection, also called Naviance, just to give you an outline of this, uh, night, this evening's program. My name's uh, Nicole Gatman. I'm also one of the counselors here. So, Ashley. Can everyone hear me? All right. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you all for having me this evening. As Ms. Getman said, uh, my name is Ashley LaFrance. I am the program manager at Kaplan Test Prep. I cover Southern New Jersey, Mercer, and um, Monmouth counties. Um, for you who don't know, Kaplan Test Prep is one of the leading test prep companies in the nation. We've been around for over 75 years. We prepare students what you're primarily interested in for PSAT, SAT, ACT. Um, also, we prep for all the grad classes as well as um, AP classes, just to give you a little bit of background if you're unfamiliar of who Kaplan Test Prep is. Uh, with that being said, I'm just going to speak briefly about uh, the differences between the SAT and the ACT. Um, if you're unaware, you may have heard last year the SAT had changed, um, so it's our new normal. This is what the SAT is. Um, the ACT got a slight update, and that update actually took place over two years ago. So the ACT updated themselves way before the SAT did. Um, so to begin with, excuse me, um, our, our timeline, um, our time frame of when all these tests take place. So back in October, I believe October 15th, all sophomores and juniors, right? All sophomores and juniors took the PSAT MSQ. T, I believe that's the exact acronym for it. Um, those scores came back to counselors on December 5th. They got a digital copy of them. Then all students who took the test should have gotten a digital copy to their email on December 12th. Then the counselors, and I didn't know the exact date of this, should have gotten two hard copies, right? You should have gotten those by were, now. They were handed out to students. Perfect, perfect. Uh, got two hard copies this year of the PSAT scores. As Ms. Getman said, each student received their scores. This is the only year they're going to be handing out two scores. Uh, so students, um, 
if you're any of you are sophomores or taking it again, even freshmen, I'm not, not sure who's all here, um, make sure you get those digital copies because your school will only be getting one copy next, from here on out. Um, so the timeline for the SAT, ACT, um, you may be wondering why we're talking about the ACT. The ACT is very, very popular these days. Um, actually, more students take it nationwide than the SAT, so I wanted to touch on it, even though New Jersey seems to be an SAT state. Um, so the February SAT did take place last weekend. It was February 11th. Um, there will be coming one up on April, 18th, April 8th, excuse me, and then June 10th, and they also has, have a September test date. Um, I find September becoming very popular for seniors. Senior just taking, oh, I'm just going to take that one ACT just to see how I'm going to do. As far as the SAT, you have March 11th. Uh, May 6th and June 3rd tend to be very popular. And then something new this year will be the August 26th test date. Will Hopewell be hosting that? Are you aware of that yet? March, not sure about August. Okay, so there is an August test date um, as well as the October test date that's always stood. Uh, August is new and the reason is they will be getting rid of the January test date, which is important for students if you were planning on taking the January, it will no longer be avail available. So you will have March, um, May, June, August, October, November, December. Those will be the times you can take the SAT. As I said, just a little chart. Nationwide, more stu students actually take the S ACT than the SAT. In 2015, it was 1.7 million versus 1.9 million. Um, if you're unaware, every school, every college does take both tests. Um, if you're still weary, my suggestion always is talk to your school. Ask them what they're looking for. Maybe the major prefers something else, but they all take both the SAT and ACT. So just getting inside the ACT and the SAT first, we're going to start with the ACT. Um, there was no change to the actual scoring. It's still 1 to 36. However, there were new scores reported, just like the SAT now has new scores reported as well. You should have seen them on your PSAT score report that you've gotten back. Um, English language arts, the average scores of the English, reading and writing, and then also a STEM score, the scores of your math and science. There's some scoring on career readiness and then text complexity. Something else they added to the ACT two years ago was they added more probability and statistics in the math section, and then within the reading, new paired passages. Honestly, there really wasn't too big of an update to this. It was more to the essay portion of the ACT. If you're unfamiliar with the ACT, but you're more familiar with the SAT, the new SAT has now an optional essay. The ACT has always had an optional essay to it. Um, However, this now requires an analysis of three different perspectives compared to what was one. It's a more rigorous type of essay. There are more scores provided. Um, it's based on ideas and analysis, development um, and support, organization, and language use. And that pretty much sums up the ACT. I do have some flyers here that give you a little bit more in-depth information. If anybody's interested, please feel free to come up to me at the end of the presentation. I'd be happy to give that to you. Um, just some statistics I thought were interesting. As I said, um, statistically, the ACT is more popular nationwide, but it's becoming more popular in New Jersey. So as you see, 2014, 2015, the, the number that took the ACT was about 30,000. It's gone up 11% to about 33,000. All right, on to the SAT. Um, the SAT had a significant change about a year ago. Uh, March of last year is when that change uh, took place. The SAT is about three hours long. However, if you decide to opt into that optional essay, it's now a three hour and 50 minute test. The essay is 50 minutes long. It's now scored on a 1600 scale compared to previously it was a 2400 scale. So for you parents out there that took the SAT and only knew it was a 1600, then there was no change to you. Um, it's now two different parts. It's evidence-based reading and writing and then the math section. Um, as I said, the optional essay is scored separately. 
Huge plus to students, please hear me out, and you should have done this on your PSAT. I hope you heard my word from the guidance counselors, and if I've ever spoken to you, answer every single question on both the SAT and the ACT. You cannot get points off for getting a question wrong. You only get a point if you get the question correct. Answer every single question. Also a bonus to students is they've gone from five answer, answer choices to four answer choices. So giving your probability of getting that answer if you were to guess, um, better for chances for yourself. So to break this down by the two sections, first we have the evidence-based reading and writing. <laughs> this is out of 800. Um, the reading details, huge plus to students, I think, is that they got rid of the sentence completion. However, there's more passages and longer passages. My suggestion to students is read. Read, 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 because that's a lot of what this new SAT is all about. Um, as you can see, it's passages, topics on U.S. history, literature, social studies, sciences. So if you enjoy those subjects, they added them into the SAT. So now your social studies and science classes do matter. Um, the reading and writing section, or excuse me, the reading section is 65 minutes long. It's the first section you'll see on the SAT. It's about 52 questions. Next is your writing and language part. Um, same thing, longer passages. It's about 35 minutes long, and it's 44 questions. Next, moving on to your math section, there's three areas of, uh, co areas of concentrated focus. Um, this is also at 800, equaling your 600 uh, uh, full score. The focus now is on problem solving and data analysis, the heart of algebra, and passport to advanced math. Anybody see what they got rid of a few last year? Big part of the SAT that they got rid of, but they added in something else. Very good, geometry. They lessen the geometry and they increase the Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 sections. Um, the math section is actually broken up into two parts. You have a 25 minute section without a calculator, and then you have a 55 minute section with a calculator. There's also multi-part uh, questions that are called item sets, um, also known as grid ends. Um, this is where you have to f bubble in your answer. There are no multiple choice answers. Huge difference between old SAT, the new SAT, and the math section I find a lot of students um, were unaware of is that they have increased the number, the reading, and the passages. They also did in the math section. The previous SAT had about 18 words per passage. Now it's about 87 words per passage. So read. <laughs> um, the essay also took a significant change to it. It is now optional. You will may have to make that decision as you're signing up to take the actual test. They do split the students up into separate rooms. It is at the end of the test, where previously it was at the beginning. It is 50 minutes long. It requires students to analyze a 650 to 750 word document and explain how the author builds an argument. Um, these are three different scores from two to eight based on your reading, analysis, and writing skills. On the SAT, there has always been an experimental section, and there still will be, and I wanted to mention this to students. Um, so College Board is still testing experimental questions, obviously to improve upon themselves each year. This impacts some students at some locations, but only students who are not taking the essay. This will add about 20 minutes a section at the end, and the trial questions can appear throughout the test. So for students, don't try to figure out which ones are the experimental questions. Just answer every question to the best of your ability. So some key differences to the SAT and ACT as they are looking fairly similar. Um, the new SAT has a greater focus on history and social studies passages. Both, they, both focus on algebra, but the new SAT has a greater emphasis on uh, data analysis and problem solving. The ACT, as I'm sure you've all heard, has a science section. Science, not like chemistry, more like graphs and charts. Um, the new SAT does require more mental math. There is a, a section, as I said, without a calculator. On the ACT, you can use a calculator on the entire test. Um, and the new SAT has gridding questions and an extended thinking gridding question. 
the extended grit uh, thinking is a multi-step gritting question, meaning you have to get part one right to get part two right. That about sums up the differences between the SAT and ACT fairly quickly. I'm happy to answer any questions. Would you care for me to do that now? Would, does anyone have any questions about SAT, ACT, anything with test prep itself, or how I can help you? Yes, sir. Is the ACT super scored like the SAT? Uh, no, because it's only one out of 36. Depends on the institution you're applying to. Some, some schools will super score the ACT, other schools will, will not. Depends on the institution. Where SATs, 99% of the colleges will give you the benefit of the doubt. If you take it two times on your report, they'll take the highest. But ACT is very, uh, it's dependent upon the institution. You're welcome. Anyone else have any questions about the SAT, ACT? Oh, I thought I was getting out of here. <laughs> so the recommended limit, um, in my opinion, um, I generally see juniors take it twice their junior year, hoping that they get the score that they want and then usually once their senior year, now that the August test date is now into play, maybe taking it August, previously it was just the October test date. That's the general time I take it, uh, the amount of times that I've seen juniors take it. I don't know if there's a penalty if someone's gonna say, wow, you took it 10 times. Some of the Ivy Leagues may look, uh, that may not look as good to them, but generally two to three times is a, is a good number to stick with. And then maybe throwing an ACT or vice versa, depending on how you want to do it. Is that a, yeah. does that about sum it I up? I mean, typically a student might take the SATs or ACT once in their junior year um, and then um, take it again in the spring, maybe in June, whatever test they feel like they're better at, you know, feel more comfortable with. And then as a senior as well, retest. Any other questions I can answer? I can't hear you, I'm so sorry. Should you just take one or the other? Is that? Is that? I mean, can you just take one SAT? Can you just take, take one? Absolutely. SAT? You do not have to take both. You can just take one, whichever one you feel more comfortable with. Um, maybe your school um, just takes one, you, maybe your major prefers one, maybe there's scholarship money on the line and that's where you're excelling. There's no need to test overwhelm yourself. We don't want to do that to students either. So if you have a focus on one, that's fine. Um, but if you think that, hey, I'm going to try to do better on the other one because that may meet scholarship money or me getting into my school of choice, there's, there's no harm in doing that too. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for having me. I will be here for the rest of the presentation if you have any other questions. And like I said, I still I have some fun flyers and fun facts for you if you're interested. Okay, so um, I'm going to highlight a few things regarding uh, the information Ashley shared with you regarding testing, and then we'll jump into um, the college search. Um, so the SATs, um, students, you probably remember maybe a few years ago, students used to register for the PSATs here at the high school. Now, um, with SATs, you need to go online, College Board, on collegeboard.com, and you need to register for that test date. Uh, which, uh, which are listed up there. The March test is here at Hopewell. Typically, a lot of students will take that for the first time. Um, students, if you're not ready to take that or you haven't signed up, don't be upset. Give yourself the time to prep and get ready, and then you have plenty of other opportunities coming up in the spring to test. Um, you can see the deadline has passed. Uh, the regular registration deadline was February 10th. I believe also the late registration has also passed as well just recently. 
Um, there's a May test, which you can take somewhere else locally. And then um, in June, there is a June administration here as well. Um, and the deadline's May 5th. With regard to ACT's separate company, so you're going to go on actstudent.org. Both, um, both organizations, you're going to form an account. So they're going to ask you a bunch of questions, um, you know, informational questions about where you might be, what your GPA, what you might be interested in. If you want that information sent to you, um, you can put your email address down, and a lot of times they'll send you information uh, via email or, um, or through the mail. There are the test dates in April and June. Typically, a lot of, I see a lot of students taking the June one. If some students have pushed up their schedule, meaning you're testing a little earlier, closer to the winter, I know this year we, they did have the January administration, so some students would test there. I know that um, now this, not for your class, but upcoming, the, there is a February administration of the ACTs now being held here. But April and June would be the next options for you. Also, um, I don't think she mentioned this, the subject tests. Um, so basically, they're one-hour tests in a particular content area. You can take up to three in one day. A lot of students ask, um, should I take them, should I not take them? Majority of colleges honestly don't ask for them. Um, but it's an opportunity for you to show your, knowledge, your wealth of knowledge in that content area. Um, one school that pops out in my head um, is Georgetown. So if you're looking at those high-tiered uh, schools, those Ivies and the Georgetowns of the world, even most of the Ivies don't require subject tests if you take the SATs or ACTs, and the SATs and the ACTs, I should say. So it's really depending upon the school. Um, so you can take up to three. You can't take them the same day as your SATs. Highly recommend that if you're going to take them, that you make sure you take them before the end of your junior year. Uh, rather than taking them when you're off on the summer and coming back fresh to a new school year. So definitely take them in the, um, in the spring, uh, May or June. Some students um, like to take them in May. If they're taking some AP courses, they're already studying, they're kind of already in that mode, kind of makes sense. Some students feel like that's just overload for them, um, which also makes sense. Um, and they like to just take them in June here. You can come in for one, you can come in for two, you can come in for three however many you choose, up to three. Um, you want to be taking that highest level course. Um, so, you know, if you want to be taking that AP course, if possible, or even honors, if you talk, definitely consult with your teacher. Um, if you've taken an honors level course, to make sure you'll have the content knowledge to be successful on that test. Um, and find out what kind of other prep you might need to do in order to be successful. Testing um, score reports. So um, we do not put any scores on our, um, our score reports. Um, many, many, many institutions, um, go to if you go to fairtest.org, do not use SATs or ACTs for, uh, for admission. So they will look at everything else you've done. Um, I feel like over the years, the list is growing and growing and growing of schools that aren't using them. Um, and some really competitive schools aren't looking at them. Um, they don't feel like they're necessarily ref, uh, reflective of, you know, going one Saturday morning to take a test. So if you're interested, you can check that out. Um, when you sign up for the test, you do get four score reports at the time of administration. So when you sign up, you can put four scores, uh, four colleges down of interest. That will be where your scores go. If you decide to test again, you need to write down either the same four scores or realize that if you want them to see your newest scores, you have to have them request to have them sent. So either way, you'll log on ACT or you'll log on College Board. Um, you can see the cost, $11, $12 per score report. So that's why what, as we move through the presentation and you're looking at schools, you really want to think about where you're looking, you know, think about the cost. It starts to add up after a while plus admission um, application fees. So you can see the cost up there. Um, SATs, like I mentioned before with the gentleman's question, um, SATs, school, we recommend that you send all your SAT scores, colleges across the board from what I understand, 
They will super score them, so they'll give you the benefit of the doubt. ACTs, like I mentioned before, are score dependent. More and more schools, I feel like now, are starting to just take the highest, but it really depends on that institution. And then score choice, they take, so let's say you sit for the test in March, and then you sit for the SATs in June, they would, you can send one particular time. So let's say your June test was far better, every section was better, you can choose to just have that score report sent. Be careful though that you check the list. There is a list on College Board that would give you information as to whether the colleges will accept it that way. Some schools, particularly Ivies, might not accept score choice. So just be careful if you are looking at those type of schools. All right, any other questions on testing? Anything that's popped up? So I, oh wait, before we move on. So test prep. So um, Ashley highlighted um, Kaplan, uh, Kaplan's one option, obviously. Um, they have some great resources on their website uh, for students to use to do practice. Students can go on College Board as well or ACT and do practice. The PSAT is a great way Hopefully those made at home. If you didn't get your scores, they're in the counseling office. Um, and we do have uh, blank booklets for you if you don't have them. What a great way to practice. Doesn't cost money, you just go back through. You know, if you take one section a morning um, and really go through and find out where you made your mistakes, where you need to, um, you know, where you, where you did well at. Um, you can see the laundry list of options. Obviously there's tons of options. Um, there is a list on our website, the counseling website, uh, for test prep. Students, you're really the best judge of this. Are you the type of student who's going to go home and, you know, commit every night to a half hour or however long, a section a night? Or are you that student who really needs to sit down in a class or one-on-one -on -one with someone and get that help? Um, so really, you're the best judge of that and what is going to be help you be, to be most successful on the test. Also, you'll, you've been probably getting a lot of emails regarding practice tests here at the um, high school. Um, different vendors do come in and give practice tests. Um, there will be more coming up. I know there's a few coming up in the spring as well. So if you're still thinking about, oh, should I take that at ACT? Should I not? Which one am I going to do better on? I don't know. This is a good way to kind of do that practice test. Get an idea of what the test is like before taking it for real. Um, and it gives you another chance. They say the more practice, the better. The more repetition, the more experience. Because then you go in and you already know what to expect. Because um, you've been on, under the uh, testing conditions. So I have the best part. Um, I, um, I love doing the college search. It is my favorite part. I think testing is boring. I always do testing with my students first. And then I get into the college search. And, what they're interested in and where they're going to go visit, it just like makes my day. So um, I think finding the right fit, uh, college, students, this is your search. Okay, your parents went through their schooling, did what they needed to do, they've done their, their search. Students, this, is, this doesn't have to be a chore. This can be something you can enjoy and go see school, see what you're interested in. These are the best four years coming up of your, you know, once you graduate, the best four years of your life. So really, really put, the more you put into it, the more the outcome is going to be fabulous. And there's tons of options, like Dr. Abrams say, said. So it is about right fit. And how are you going to find that? So obviously we're here. It's the beginning of February. We're starting early. Okay, so you definitely want to start early, start talking about this. Um, later on, I know I'm going to mention about junior college meetings. I know the counselors pretty much have met with each junior, um, and if they haven't, I'm sure you're going to be getting contacted this week um, to meet with your counselor. Um, so that's, that's why we're starting now. We were in the classrooms and met with students, and now we're having these programs, and it's only February. It's early February. Obviously, you can talk to other people about their experience, you know, past graduates, family, friends, etc. Um, 
And you want to lay out all your possibilities. So see what options you have. Sometimes a student is dead set on one particular institution. If that's you, you're sitting in the crowd right now, and you're like, I only want to go to Rutgers. That's the only place I want to go. Be, be, please be open-minded and look everywhere, OK? Really look at all your options. And then you want to do your research. Really know about that school. And we're going to talk a lot about ways of how to get that information and that do your research. Research is the key. And it'll leave you, leave you with the best possibilities. And the, it'll give you a well-developed, be able to compare all your options at the end. And then visit, which I'll talk about. And then gathering your college materials, which a lot of it now, honestly, I think is a lot less paper and more electronic. So most of it is um, on the computer. So here's all the different types of schools. Um, you have your different categories. So you can see on the left-hand side your four-year schools. So you know your Rutgers, your Princeton's, your Drews. I just named some New Jersey schools. Um, whether they're um, Princeton, Ivy League, your named schools, your state colleges. On the right side, which I'll, let me come back to, at the bottom you'll see your specialized schools those students that are interested in the music areas, so they might look at a conservatory, or they might be that student who really wants that four-year experience and also be in the music program as well. I know Montclair is a, is a, right now for music, they have a really great music program, so a lot of students look there, they go there for music, whatever, music theater maybe, and then they also have that four-year experience as well so they can major in something else, where if you go to conservatory or a specialized music school, you're just there for that. Um, art schools, pretty popular as well. Tyler School of Art, you can go to RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, so there's tons of options like that. Culinary schools, so if you're into the um, cooking world, you can definitely explore options like that that are available to you. And then the health sciences. So um, again, like nursing, for example, some, school, some students will go to a four-year institution for nursing, like Drexel, or some students will decide to go to you know, a specialized program right out of a hospital, like Aria Health actually has a program right at their hospital that you can get your degree at. Um, so that's kind of like your specialized areas. I feel like they kind of have multiple parts to it, like you're applying, there might be an audition, there might be a portfolio. So those are kind of your special areas. And then in the top right corner is your two-year colleges, which I find now are be, it's becoming more of a, um, an, a, a stu, uh, an option that students are considering. Um, Mercer County does have agreements with a lot of four-year schools. So basically, when, if you are looking at a two-year op, two option and going to community college first, you can save some money. And then you also can have that guaranteed uh, dual admission program where you can attend that school when you're done. They actually also have um, some schools that have classes right on their campus. So you can actually get your degree and stay at, and stay at Mercer for four years. So, um, so those are some things to think about. So it's kind of like the different areas as you're looking at schools. So a list. So some of you probably have two or three schools. Some of you right now, what, that those of you who have started thinking about it might have 15 schools, 20 schools. Um, how do you get it down? When do you get it down? So I usually tell my, I tell my students, and I think it's pretty much similar across the office, that pretty much you're going to go visit, which we're going to talk about in the spring. And then I would say summer, entering your summer, you probably would have like Maybe, I don't know, if we're aiming for six or eight schools, you might be at that like 10 to 15 mark, the 12 mark, 12 schools. Um, some students, depends on the student, but typically that's what I say if you're looking to apply to, typically I would say kids apply to eight to 10 schools. And then usually as senior year starts and you start applying, the list might change a little bit. Um, so they usually, people, students usually get it down to about 10 schools. I think that's, you know, high. I think the students can come in, and I always push for about six schools, which I know is low. So basically, you have your two reach schools. Really want to go to Princeton? 
I don't know if it's going to happen, but I'm going to shoot for the stars and see what happens. And, you know, and see what happens in the end. Um, your target schools, you, you're right there on Family Connection. You have the numbers. You can go either way. And then your, um, we call them probable, or I call them, also call them likely schools, schools that you definitely have the criteria, you've shown interest, and you most likely will get in there. So, and I mean, we don't have crystal balls uh, to predict this, but we use family connection, the scattergrams, which Mr. Devone's gonna talk about tonight, to kind of give you a general idea. So if you come into the counselor and kind of ask us these questions, we can give you a general idea if you're gonna get in. Um, we're not always right, because again, we're not sitting on those college panels making those decisions. Um, so um, that's typically kind of the list. Usually, I would say if you can get it, you know, those students that are looking at high numbers of schools, you know, two, two, and two, two targets, two reaches, two uh, likelies, somewhere in that ballpark, maybe three, three, and three, however you want to um, distribute it. So decision factors. So some students will go to a school <laughs> and they'll walk on their campus and they won't be able to explain to their parents they just don't want to be there. It's just not right. They will get out of the car and they're like, I just don't want to be here. That's going to happen. Um, and that's pretty, it's just that, it's just that feeling that you get when you're on a college campus for students. You're like, it's either right or it's not right. So what do you consider? What are you looking for as you make these decisions about the right fit school? The size of the school. So I only can use myself as an example. I went to University of Delaware, which I love. I'm a big Blue Hen fan. Um, so it's not a huge school, but it's not a small school. Now, I came from a high school that was 1,000 students in my graduating class in Pennsylvania. So for me, even though it was big, it wasn't, it wasn't something I wasn't unfamiliar with. From here, it is a little bit of a change, going from 300 students, you know, a school of 1,200 to a school of 15, 18,000 students. So consider size. You know, are you, that one, are you that student that needs to be, you know, the professor needs to know your name, and, you know, you can't just be kind of in the, in the woodwork. Um, I mean, most professors, as I went through, Delaware, I would say as the class size went down, the class size wasn't huge, but in a 100, class, 100 student lecture hall, they're not going to know everyone's name. Um, so that's something to definitely consider. Location, I personally loved it um, because my parents were an hour and a half away, um, and they could come, and I was very close to my family. Um, and they also didn't just show up in my dorm room. Parent, students, parents, don't show up at your dorm room. Even if you go down the street, trust me. Um, so I think that's important. Are you the type of student that, you know, wants to, can, wants to be, you know, train right away? Do you want to be on a plane? Some students don't like to be that far away because they know that the chances of them coming home more frequently are just going to be for, like, Christmas, you know, the holidays or in the summer. So you really have to think about where you want to be geographically. Um, the type of school. So some school students come in and they're like, Ms. Gatman, I have no idea where I want to be, what kind of camp, what type of campus I want. So I always tell students, we're in New Jersey, we have schools right here. You don't have to go far. All you have to do is go to TCNJ, Ryder, and Rutgers. And you can compare those three schools, not because you want to go there, just to get an idea of what they're like. You have an urban environment, they're all very different. They have different fields, they have different campuses. Um, so that's a good way if you have no idea. Um, the surrounding community. So you know, most institutions, I would say, probably have a good relationship, but what is that surrounding community like? You know, are you, you, do you need to be concerned about your safety when you're off campus? Um, you know, different th factors like that. Personality of the campus. So this is really big for me. Um, when I go to a campus and I visit, and I've been to a lot of schools, even as a student, when you go to Delaware, people are Blue Hen fans. People are wearing the clothing. You go to other schools, they're wearing every other school, and there's no school spirit. So if students, if this is something that you want, look, walk around a little bit. Kind of like when you're on that tour, you know, kind of go off on your own. See what kind of clothes, what, what schools they're wearing on their shirt. Are they wearing, if you're at Rutgers, I'm sure they're wearing Rutgers clothing. 
you know, some of the other schools, maybe not so much. How important is that to you? For me at Delaware, everyone was blue hen. It was like blue hen country. That's what people wore. And I love that. And that was like, that was like the whole, you know, that was important to me at the time. So it might be important to you to have that school spirit and that sense of community. Um, diversity. So you might be looking for certain, um, you know, whatever kind of diversity you're looking for on your campus, on that campus, which I think is important too um, to consider. And then athletics and activities. So what are you going to be involved in? What are you going to bring to their campus? What do, you, what do you enjoy doing here at Hopewell Valley that you want to take there as well? Um, so I think that's something important to look at. So to continue on, here are some other factors to consider. Entrance requirements, so what are they looking for when you apply to the school, um, which are listed on their websites. Those are minimum requirements. Um, that's the basics of what they're looking for. Obvious, obviously, if you're applying to school, a lot of students might, obviously might exceed those requirements. Um, the difficulty of entrance, so what kind of grades are they looking for in rigor, public and private, um, the reputation of the school, um, and again, it, I guess it depends on who you talk to um, and ask about each institution. Um, the commitment to the major, so when you go, definitely talk to the professors, talk to the students in that major, what's the chances of getting a job, what's their placement right, if you're thinking about law school, med school, grad school, what is their percentage of admittance to those, in, to those schools, what percentage of students are finishing in four years, like Dr. Abrams said. It's not always happening at schools. Um, so, you know, do you want to make sure you can finish in four years? Are you going to be able to get into the classes you need? And then costs. And I think one of the reps said it last week, you know, really you need to have this conversation with your child early in the process. So be upfront about it, who's paying for it, what's the, you know, um, what's the plan for that? So that way everyone's on the same page at the, at the onset um, and there's no surprises or disappointments. Um, so your college search, here's some things that it might include. Um, we can all go to those gorgeous websites. They all look pretty. I haven't found one that looks bad. Um, and the, you know, um, the vi virtual tours, they're great. Um, they probably highlight, I would guess, some of the schools highlight their new buildings and their fanciest places, and you don't see the rest of the campus. Um, so you can do that. Um, we have college visits here, which I would highly recommend. Students, if you go on Family Connection, you can sign up in the fall, and you can come talk to the representative. 99% of them are the first ones that are going to read your application. So again, um, we'll talk about demonstrated interest in a moment. You'll be able to be able to connect with that rep. Um, you might not think they remember you, but they, mu they might um, as they're going through their applicants. Um, so I would definitely highly recommend that coming to those visits if you haven't as a junior. Um, brochures and guidebooks obviously are available. Um, and then the college fair, we put the date up there um, at Mercer County Community College. It's actually on April 25th. Good opportunity to go around and get information. Um, and real, you know, and ask good questions. I don't know, someone told me, I, I forget where I was recently, but someone said when we were talking about college fairs, and the person actually gave really good advice to me, and they said when you go to a college fair, make sure you go with a plan, because it's really easy, right, to go to the college fair, and you think you're going to go to all these tables and get all these documents and talk to all these people, and then it turns out that you and your parents run into a family friend, and you stand there for 15 minutes talking, and then you go 10 feet and you start talking to someone else. So really go with the plan and the intent is to go and meet with the reps and really kind of um, hopefully eliminate some of those distractions while you're there. Uh, because before you know it, it's, I think it starts at seven. It's only two hours. Before you know it, it's already eight o'clock and you might have gone 15 feet because you know Johnny, Mary, and Susie and you now talk to them for an hour. So um, just something to think about as you plan the, that visit those fairs. College search. So I like, I like bleed college visits. 
I talk about this all the time. You have to go see the schools. It's not, there's nothing else better said than that. You got to go. You got to go on a tour. Students, you ask the questions. The reps don't want to hear from your folks. Sorry, parents. They want to hear from students. They want to hear what questions you have. When you go in the missions office, for those of you here two weeks ago for the college panel, you introduce yourself. You say what you're, what you're thinking of studying. You do that. I know it's hard. I'm thinking about myself 20 years from now when my children are older and kind of taking a step back, but you need to. The reps really, the admissions people really want to see the student do, um, uh, speak for themselves. When you're scheduling the college tour or you're going to visit schools, I know April's a good time to go. Coming up next week, we're off for two days. Some students have talked about going on some visits then. Students, I know you're busy. You need to be calling, or you need to be going online and scheduling the visits. They want to hear from students. They're not interested in hearing from your parents. Obviously, they're going to answer your parents' phone calls if they're contributing and paying the bills and whatnot, but they want to hear from students. Um, yeah, that's a good suggestion. A lot of schools now are doing what Ashley just mentioned. This, they have a student tour and a parent tour, and I know some institutions are doing that, which I think is a good idea. Um, but even when you're on that tour, take a walk off for a minute. You know, I, I feel like sometimes those re the um, tour guides are very programmed in what they say. They're told what to say. Um, so take a walk off. You know, see what the morale is on the campus. See how the dining room is. See what the, you know, what the, are they friendly? Are they just going to walk by you and not even say hello? What kind of campus is it? Maybe go on a Saturday, you know? Obviously not on a holiday weekend, but on a Saturday at Delaware, I can tell you what's going on. People are up, people are getting ready. There might be a football game. People are at the football games, they're well attended. People go back, they, you know, spending time with their families, their friends, there's studying going on, library's busy. So you have to figure out what kind of campus you want. Some campuses you walk around with, you know, my sister went to a small school. I don't know how she survived there. You walk around on a Saturday, Sunday, even a Friday, and you don't see three students but walking around the place. I'm like, where is everyone? They're, you know, it's a very small campus. So it depends on what you're looking for. Um, overnight stays, I think they're good once you, um, once you get admitted. Um, I know we have friend and sibling up there. If you do do that, that's fine. Make sure you sign in the admissions office and let them know you're there. Sometimes it's good to not stay with a friend. I feel like you get a different perspective um, than a student from Hopewell who's gone through Hopewell. Um, get someone some, from somewhere else that kind of knows what it's like, you know, get their take on how the school is. Um, visiting a class, usually typically after you get admitted. Um, interviews, typically, I mean, some of the smaller schools are doing them. I would say a lot of the larger institutions aren't. Just because of the volume of applications, they're not doing it. Um, and then also demonstrated interest, which I know was talked about two weeks ago at the college panel. Some schools are looking at it. They're tracking if you open their emails. They're tracking if you've uh, visited. They're tracking how many emails you send them. Every time you come to a college visit, whatever you do, they're tracking. Other schools, it's not, as, it's not tracked at all. So. Any questions so far? Anything? Okay. Uh, continuing on. So junior college meetings, um, I can say probably all of us are pretty close to being done. So your students should have materials. Um, they should know how to get on family connection. We actually went over that in class as well with students uh, to learn to use that tool, which we're going to talk about in five minutes. Um, and then um, it's really good. I think that like provides a, um, a great opportunity for students and parents to go on together. It's a one account per family. So you have to log in with your son or daughter, which I think kind of leads to a really great discussion. Um, as you see when Mr. Devone shows you all the different um, highlights of the program. Um, oh, so the common data set, which I think is awesome and gives so much information. So basically, as you can see there, 
it's um, a collaborative effort among data providers in higher ed, the higher ed community, and the publishers of College Board, Peterson's, US News, they kind of come together and put all this data together, and they call it the common data set. And the common data set is done for each institution, each university. So what does it include? And now, let me tell you, there are about 30 pages each, as I was thumbing through two of them today. They're really long, and they're really, 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 really good. Um, I was quite impressed with the amount of information. So this doesn't even cover, like, literally five pages of the data. I just picked a few key things out that I thought were uh, highlights. But there's so much information. So you can see um, some examples, enrollment, graduation rates, retention rate. So retention rate meaning between freshman and sophomore year, how many students stay on campus. Um, admission, freshman uh, wait list. So how many students got in and how many students were put on the wait list. Some schools put a lot of students on their wait list. Other students don't. Uh, admissions requirement actually goes through each um, each area, English, math, science, social studies, and it actually has check boxes, and it actually checks off what you need uh, for requirements, and the distribution of them, how, what's required, what's recommended, and then it goes through testing. All their te I mean, I wrote testing, because I would be writing another five slides of what's included. It goes through SATs, ACTs, you name it, it's on there. Um, and then they have like a whole section on transfers, so let's say you end up at a school and then you decide to transfer somewhere else. What's their transfer rates? What's their, I mean, you, every number you possibly can think of is on here. So I just, um, so just out, of, just out of curiosity, I had Google two schools. So I picked College in New Jersey. So if you type in Google, College in New Jersey, common data set, this is what you'll get. And then at the bottom, if you scroll down, you would be able to see their whole common data set. And I actually, um, I actually brought it with, I don't know if anyone wanted to see it, if there, there was a school there, but I actually brought the, hand, the printout just because it's really, really interesting what's included. Um, so that was one. And then I was like, hmm, I should do a different school. So I did Princeton. So I was, I was kind of um, amazed what I saw when I, so I typed in Princeton University Common Data Set, and this is what popped up on their website. So they actually not only give you their Common Data Set, but they also give you the other schools, the other IVs. So you kind of get all that information. Um, so if you're interested in those two schools, I have the handouts here. I'd be happy to give it to you. Um, if not, then you can obviously Google it. But I thought it was really, uh, thanks to Dr. Abrams for encouraging us to include it, I think it was really worth taking a look at. I mean, it's just the information is just invaluable. It gives you really all those numbers that we always look for. They're all right there. So. Any questions on my section? So each student has their, um, so is it one per family? The question is, is there one account per family? And if you have more than one child, what do you do? Each student has their own account. A couple things. Uh, when uh, Ms. Getman was talking about visits, college visits, if you're bringing your child to a college visit, don't you go up to the desk say, hi, we're here for a visit. Mm -mm. Have your child do it, because they're looking for independence, right? So, and they make notes of everything. If you have a question, have your child call, because, and don't, and don't and I've had parents do this, don't call and say, hi, I'm, you know, Sally from Hopewell. No, they know it's you, don't call. Have, I'm telling you, you laugh, but it's true. Don't do it, because they know. So have your child do it, and, and students, really, they want to talk to you. They're like, oh, Sally called. Wow, she had a great question. Try not to ask questions that you can find on the website. Come up with something interesting, you know, that you're really curious about. And they will note that down. That's part of demonstrated interest. As Ms. Getman said, not everybody does counts demonstrated interest, but they do. So just, you know, keep that in mind. The other thing is um, email addresses. Once you start applying, you're going to be getting a lot of emails. Please do not use sexybabe at hotmail.com, okay? No, no, no. Students, use, you know, first name dot last name at Gmail or Hotmail, okay? And keep it separate so you will always know to check it, because otherwise it'll get lost in the shuffle and you may not get an important piece of information. Yes? Can you use your school email? 
What do you say, no? I honestly, I mean, it sounds like a great idea because you already have it open. I honestly would open a new Gmail account, first name, last name, if you don't have one, at gmail.com or whatever, whatever you choose. And that way, those schools that you're truly interested in, you can just put on the application their, e that email address versus, you know, thumbing through all these emails. Because um, some schools are tracking if you open their email, even though a lot of students don't, that, don't know that. Also, on that note, on social media, students, be really careful what you're posting on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all these things out there. Sometimes we think we can delete it. It's still there. Colleges are looking at that. They, ha they can access that. So be really careful what you're putting up on there. Yeah, and the other thing is colleges will hire companies to sift through social media. Because remember, when you do your application, you're presenting a very, very clean picture. I'm not saying that you're doing bad things on social media, but sometimes, you know, like if you're seen there holding a red cup, even though it might be a red cup of Coca-Cola, they say, oh, this is interesting, underage drinking, right? So you don't want those pictures up there. And if someone posts on your Facebook page something that you think your grandmother would be upset about, then take it off, okay? Um, yes. How long do you have access to HVRSD email until you graduate? And then they, they, they clean it out. So really get a separate email for college. Any other questions about that? Yes. Sorry? OK. Do you want to ask it? Go ahead. So the question is, how would, would you change the way you look at college, getting into college if you know your child isn't going directly but will do a gap year? I would say still look at it the same way because our philosophy is and our strategy is, if you're going to take a gap year, get accepted to a school. So you have an admission offer and you can call the school and say, listen, I'd like to defer my admission for a year. Would you mind? I want to take a gap year. Gap years are not bad. Colleges like it when students take gap years because, A, they've flushed out a lot of, of, a lot of kids, right? So they have empty seats and they want to fill. So they know this is a guaranteed seat, maybe, if you're coming in, you're going to fill. Two, they also, you're more mature when you're going to college, right? You've had some life experience. You've been out on your own. You're coming in a little older. You pretty much know what you want. That being said, you don't have to go to that school. You can say at the end, I don't want to, and apply to a different school because your tastes may have changed, right, as a student. Yeah. Not right away. I would get the I admission wouldn't. and then call them and say, do you mind if I defer my admission? Yeah, what, at, apply, because you're not going to know if you're taking a gap year right out of the box, right? Like, or, do you know now your child's going to take a gap year? No, you don't. So you want, to, you want to go through the search and you want to apply. Once you've been accepted, or, you know, if, and you decide, ah, no, I really want to go to Bali for a year and study yoga, okay, that's fine, but let them know. You, you can look on, online, but many, I mean, Harvard encourages it, right? I was on a panel with gap year schools, and they're like, yeah, we love it. Call them, be honest with them, right? I want to take a gap year, this is what I'm planning to do, May I defer my admission? And they'll either say, ah, not a good idea. And then you decide, do I really want to take the gap year? Do I want to stay? Or apply at another time. You know, it's, it's fluid. And they understand that. And they, they really do like it. And actually, students do better in college after a gap year. Come to our gap year night. You'll hear all about it. It's like you're adding gap year as one of your options rather than I, it sounds almost sneak, like you're not trying to be sneaky about no. it, but you want to add gap year as an option. Okay, I'm going to apply to three schools. I'm going to apply for, you look into a gap year, and maybe I'm going to look, add the community college as another option. And then at the end, you're going to evaluate which one's the best option. But I would not tell the institutions no. in the front end. I would tell them at the back end once you make that final decision. I th if I remember correctly, a lot of schools will let you um, defer, but definitely check that because I remember a story, and I can't remember it off the top of my head, in the last few years that a student that wanted to defer and that couldn't. They wouldn't let them. But, but most schools will let you. And it's important to have your child make that call. Like we just had a, um, 
an example of a student that got accepted to a college. She got a great scholarship. They kept calling her. We want you to apply for this merit scholarship. We want you to apply. And the mom called and said, she doesn't want to go. What do I do? Now, you don't have to do anything, right? You just say, I don't want to go, or never return the phone call. No. She called and said, listen, I just want to tell you, I am so sorry. Thank you so much for considering me for this scholarship. I really don't want to attend your school. I, it's just not the right fit. The admissions officer almost fell off his chair. He's like, oh my God, you called? Thank you so much. I, you know, I wish we could have more students do this. So they really appreciate that, having that dialogue. But your child has to have the dialogue, OK? OK. OK. Um, so just to, one more thing, one more slide just to close, and then I'll let Mr. Devon speak. Um, so different types of decisions, as application decisions, as you start applying, in the, typically students can start in August. Um, the common application, which covers over 300 schools, will uh, open August 1st, typically. Um, so here's the decisions. Early decision, I'll start with the second one down. Early decisions binding, schools that offer that. It's 100% your first choice. You don't want to be anywhere else. Um, so for example, if you apply early decision to Lehigh, You've been there, you've visited, you've done everything, you've shown interest, you submitted your application by November 1st or November 15th. You don't have any dreams of being at Lafayette. So, and there are tribals for those of you who don't know. So, you want to make sure that this is really the place you want to be. Students love it because they know by the holidays, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever holiday you celebrate, they know where they're going to school. It's like clean sailing. They keep up their grades, they do what they need to, and they're great. Sometimes parents don't like it as much because you don't have the opportunity to compare scholarship packages. Whatever financial aid they offer you is pretty much what you have to accept. So that's the only caveat. So really definitely have those conversations about if early decision is the way to go. Early at I just wanted one more thing about early decision, sorry. Um, colleges mostly take a, a bulk of their class from early decision. That's because it's a guaranteed seat. It's really a contract that you can't break. If you break it, it looks bad for us. And they talk to each other and say, oh, you know, Hopewell, they reneged on the contract. Because you're literally signing a contract, okay? So if you're bleeding those colors and you want to go, you have a better shot of getting an early decision. As Ms. Getman said. Especially the small, pro small yeah. liberal arts schools. I think um, Lafayette, just to use one example, I think they were upward of 35, 40, 50 percent of their class is admitted, early, early decision. Bucknell is another one, accepts a lot of kids. We've had a lot of kids recently, be apl they apply early decision there. They accept a huge number of their weight, uh, not percentage of their class, early decision. Great question to ask when you're on their campuses. Um, what, how, what their percentages are like. But I'm con I can tell you from experience, liberal arts, small liberal arts schools, those type of schools, the percentages are very high. Downside, you're not going to get the aid package that you might expect because there's no need to incent you to go to the school. They got you. That's it. They've caught you. You're in. So just keep that in mind. It's a very, very big decision. It's almost like a marriage you can never get out of. Okay? So you're in it. You're in it. All right? I don't know if it's that bad. It's bad. <laughs> um, okay, and then early action is non-binding. Um, you can you can get all your hear all your options, hear back, and make a decision by November, uh, May first as to what school you want to uh, apply um, enroll in. You can compare packages. You can compare campuses. You can go back and see the, all the schools, all those type of things. Rolling admissions. Um, basically, you apply. Once you apply, once they have a completed application in six to eight weeks, they hear back, you hear back. So sometimes students love that because if you apply in September and October and you're on top of things, you hear back, um, you know, early winter. And then just your regular admissions, um, you know, and the deadlines fall anywhere. They can go all the way as late as March. Typically, most students here, my experience, usually they're applying in the fall, September, October. Um, it seems like... In the last few years, it seems like, even this year, it seemed like we had increased numbers of kids applying early to school. Um, the application deadlines seem to be moving up, creeping up. I know there were some deadlines even in um, October 15th. I had an October 12th. Um, so they're definitely creeping up. Um, but if you really aren't sure and you're really not, you, wanna, you still have some work to do, 
um, with regard to where you're looking, then definitely, you know, you can consider regular. Um, so any other questions before I, Frank I just, of course, I have one more thing to add, I'm sorry. Early decision, getting back to that. Strategically, there are two, sometimes two periods. There's early decision one and early decision two. So if you have your heart set on two schools and bleed four colors or however many colors it is, you can apply early decision one, which means you can't apply to any other school early decision for that period. If you're denied, you can apply early decision two to another school. Okay, just so you know. And I, I, we've had students who have done that. It worked out very well for them. Question. Good question. Um, early action is non-binding, so that I find that to be an advantage. Okay. It also you're done early and you find out early, which is good. Otherwise, you find out, find out later in the cycle, and by May first you have to decide. So I would rather, you know, it's it's a relief for seniors to say, ah, oh, by December I know, and I don't have to worry about it. I'm in. This is it. That doesn't mean you get senioritis. Okay. No, no. Um, but. That it's really, that's the advantage, and it is non-binding. There's also, uh, what's that, where's Nicole? What's the one that, uh, um, early action, there's another early action. Single choice. Single choice early action. You can only apply. So Yale. Yale has Yale single choice. Early, yeah, sing, yeah, single it's choice or non-binding, non but you can only apply to one school early action. So they have million, and then some of them have early, early action in, in the summer. It's insane. Really, it's insane. Look on the website, make sure you know when the deadline so are. So early action used to be like some kids did it, not everyone when it first came out. Um, but now I feel like everyone's doing it. It used to be the it's like you're showing more interest in the institution, so you're applying early. Honestly, if you have your stuff done by the early decision, early action deadline, I would say submit. The only reason not to if you're talking to your counselor and you're waiting on, I don't know, grades, you know, you need to show more progress in your academics, you want to show improvement, you know, you're waiting on something else, your test scores might not be where you want them to be, then I would say maybe not do it. But for the most part, I don't think it can hurt you. So, all right, Frank Devone. Okay, hello. I'm Mr. Devone, Frank Devone. Um, just started here. I'm replacing Mr. Fiola this year, so if you don't know me, here I am. So um, I kind of forgot what I was supposed to be talking about. It was been it's been a long presentation. Oh, family connection. That's right. I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. I'm kidding. No, of course. So no family connection. It's really this great thing. Um, if does anyone not know how to log into Family Connection? Because I could show you that. If you're not sure, okay. It's really easy. You start out on our website. And it basically, you go through the counseling department. I have slides for that. But before we get to that, so this really helps you to compare and contrast colleges. You know, instead of sitting and in, in, in Googling every school, this is like one-stop shopping. You log in. You, you, you search the schools that you're interested in. There's search tools, which makes it really easy. So you, based on your location, your, your test scores, the cost, whatever you want, there's all these options. So it, it really, it's, it's everything's where, right in one spot, so you don't have to keep, um, you know, looking things up. So, and ultimately, what we're going to do is we're going to have you guys apply through the schools. We're going to upload documents through here. So it's really both ends. It's your, it's your account, but it's also our account, which is connected. So it really creates this, you know, seamless um, process for us, to, for you to apply. Um, so basically, also, student, and parent brag sheets are on there, which are really important um, because we do see your students, but we don't know them nearly as much as their teachers do. So this is a good way for us to get to know them. So how's it accessed? So we, you access it through the web. It's basically available on our website, the CHS homepage. Then you go to the counseling services link, and then you go to the family connection link, and you log in through there. So this is where, you know, once you've gotten to the high school website, you've gotten to the counseling services homepage, this is what you'll see. So over here on the right, you look down, you click on Family Connection, and it brings you right into your login area. And so basically, we've been meeting with every junior. We met with them in the classrooms, and we met with them one-on-one -on -one to get 
you know, give them some inf more information, making sure they know how to log in. So they should have their login codes. If they don't, not a problem. They can come see us tomorrow or their earliest, most earliest convenience. We'll get, it, get them lo set in or log in. It's really easy. So they this can, is they use their not to interrupt. Yeah. They use their yeah. school email, and you see in the big red circle. Forget your password. Just click that, and then it'll send it to you. If it doesn't, then she doesn't email. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's pretty simple. So. All right. So when you do log in, this is like the home page. What it looks like. You can see there's the three tabs across the top: colleges, careers, and about me. So in these different tabs, there are different features. So under colleges, obviously, you have all the college search options. So they create their list of schools that they're considering. Um, there's, you know, there's so much information here. We can't go over it all. I know you've been here. You're very patient. You've been here all night. So it's, it's great that you're here because it shows you're really concerned. Um, so, but you know, there's other tools in there that, you know, the careers tab is great. Searching careers if you're not sure even what you want to do which I think is probably step one, is kind of have a general idea of why you're even going to college. What's the point? You know, why are we going here? Are we going here just to go to spend a bunch of money and sit in classrooms? Or do you, you know, are you going to have a career at the end of this, hopefully? <laughs> so you could, you know, be independent. You know, that's the goal, right? So um, the career tab, definitely check that out. The about me tab, um, you can get um, your test scores from there. There's a, a resume builder there, which I love. It's really easy to use. Um, that's where the student brag sheets and the parent brag sheets are located. Please complete your brag sheet. Please, yes. Please. I feel like I just have to chime right. in. So every year, every year, I send out emails. Last year was probably topped it all. I must have sent out 20 reminders. So I always make my, and I tell the students this too, I always make my deadline. We all kind of have similar deadlines. Some of us are earlier than others, similar though in nature. And I always make it the day before spring break. So last year, I must have sent out 20 emails because my plans, and I always tell my students, over spring break, Miss Getman is not out hanging out at the, you know, I don't know, don't go on vacation or anything like that. I go I'm on vacation. Home. <laughs> I'm home writing <laughs> letters. This is what I do. I get a lot done over spring break, so I always insist. So this year, it worked out for me. And I think it's going to work, and I'm going to get a higher percentage. They are so important. I use them. We all use them. We don't, I tell the students, we don't know everything about you. I don't live at your house. Your parents know a lot about you. You know yourself the best. This really, really helps us. The more time you spend on them, the better my letter is. I wrote some of the best letters for those kids that spent time on them. I know which kids spend time on them. Some kids write two sentences, and you know they didn't spend one minute on them. Other kids spend hours on them, and they re it really, really helps us. So this year I was creative, so it worked out for me, and I think it's going to work out at the end. My anniversary is on March 31st, and that's the day before spring break. So I bet you, and I told every student, that's my anniversary gift, is for them to be done their brag sheet so I can go home for spring break and write all my letters. So we'll see if it works out, Mr. I'm DeVille. sure it will. I'm sure it will. No one wants to ruin so your anniversary. So complete your brag sheets, please, students, so That's we don't right. have to nag you, or at least, well, I might not be the one to nag you, but you won't have to get emails from us. So how does this help? What, what's the point of Family Connection? So I kind of explained it already, but it really is organized, and it's an efficient way to get all that information. It's like a container. Um, and it's also, like Ms. Uh, Getman said earlier, for you guys to sit down together as, as parent and student to have a good conversation together. Um, but, of course, we are hoping that, you know, the student will step up and, and basically take the lead on definitely contacting and searching the schools. But this is a great time for, as a family, to get together and talk about this big decision that's happening. Um, so we have your records in there, which is really important because we're going to have to send all this stuff out when your students apply. So we, we upload it. We send it out. You know, most of, most of the time we don't have to mail anymore. Back in the day when I went to school, it was basically you, you stuff big envelopes and hope it doesn't get stuck in the machine in the post office. You know, so this is great. It, um, it basically, it, it gets uploaded, it gets sent, they get it the same day, like within minutes. So it's, it's awesome. Um, also, there's a great comparison tools where you could see the realistic possibilities based on your child's uh, test scores, their grades, um, 
and they basically, um, you, you know, they could see how they compare to other people who have also been accepted at that school. So this is uh, kind of what the, the parent brag sheet looks like. You just, you basically click on the link. It's over on the, the left-hand side. There'll be a link for um, student and parent brag sheets once you click on the About Me tab. And you just type in the information. And don't forget to save it, because if you navigate away, it won't save. You have to save it at the bottom. There's a little button that says Update, which is the Save button. So you just answer the questions. It's really, it's pretty simple. Um, I think more information is better, but it doesn't have to be like an essay per question. You know, we just need to kind of know the details, what you're into. Bless you. So do before spring break, typically this is kind of like the deadline just so we can get a head start to writing because if we have to write all these letters in the fall, we don't want to be rushed. We want to write the best possible letters for your students because we want to make sure they get in to the schools they want. So this really helps to get an early start. It's part of preparation and planning. All right, so creating the list uh, with your college search. So there are, there are college search options here. Um, so this is really important for you guys, again, to generate lists of schools that basically offer the program that you're considering. You know, they fit the criteria you're looking for. It's, you know, if it's distance, is it cost, is it name recognition, what it, whatever you may be, you want to create that list so you have something to work with. You don't want to wait to the last minute and have deadlines looming and, you know, say, oh, I haven't really thought of this, you know, which sometimes happens, but, um, we, you know, we have these, these tools available, which I recall we didn't have it all. It was just kind of up to us. You know, so this is a beautiful thing. I think it's amazing to have these resources available. This is a beautiful search tool. I think it's just awesome. These, the orange tabs you see up there, they're all criteria, different criteria. So you, it goes from location. So you select which location. Where do you want to go to school? Is it West Coast, East Coast, Central? You want to go international? Um, the types of school, just click on it. It's great. So when you click on those options, a whole list of schools immediately pops right up. And then you have an option to add them to your list, which is great. So it's there for you to peruse and, and dig into further. So when you actually click on the school, you can get that information you're looking for. It's like this. So when you actually click on one of the college names, you get this awesome dashboard, kind of quick facts, um, which is really useful. Have any of the students in the room gone to these pages yet? Have you seen them? Yeah. Yeah. So it's really helpful, right? Like you get down to the bottom. And you could see these little cool little dials like in your car. Like it shows you, like if you're in the green, you know, okay, my GPA is pretty good. Um, if you're in towards the red, you're like, ooh, okay, maybe this is a reach school. You know what I mean? So like it really tells you immediately where you stand, which I think is fantastic if you're trying to generate the list of, um, you know, hopefully around 10 or less schools, right? We don't go crazy, but I understand why you want to put them out there. So. Um, school stats. So this is kind of nice. You can see in a nice list clearly how they compare um, to each other. And there's another one where you can actually, um, it's like the overlaps where you can see your information right at the top, see where, how you compare with the schools. Yeah, this is it right here. So at the top, so we, we created a, a fake student just for fun, um, for demonstration purposes only, obviously. I have a college is the fake student name, but that's where your, your, your name would be as a student at the very top. So that's your numbers and how you compare to the other schools in the list. So if it's red, that means you're below where you should be. So, um, but it's a great quick at a glance look. Um, the scattergram's great too. If you like visual, I'm, I'm a big fan of the scattergram because it's easy to tell. You know, the cloud there, the drift, so the green squares are, are kids who are accepted. And your uh, information is also in there. You'll be like a little icon. And you can see where your average is and some test scores in the bottom, the SAT. So it's pretty nice. You can see exactly if you're, if you're, in, you know, if you're in the, in the, deep in the center, you're looking pretty good. If you're kind of in the outskirts, the outliers, it's not so good. Just, be, just note that it's only Hopewell Valley students. Correct. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so these are students from Hopewell Valley who have been accepted, You've right? Accepted. So that's the key word, accepted, so you know where you stand with other kids who have been accepted in the past. So I think it's a great tool so you can kind of measure where you're at. Um, college match, is, you know, this is great. Does, you know, are these, are these schools, are they going to fit with you? Um, so they give you a quick little information about each school. 
I'm going to kind of move through you. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So this is good. This is really important. In the fall, we are going to have so many people coming in from colleges to talk to your kids. It's really important if a school that you're interested in is coming, sign up. So you got to log into Family Connection. Check it out. It's under My Colleges over on the right. Upcoming visits, click on the link. You can see what and when, and, and you, you sign up right there. It's so easy. You get a pass in the morning. Make sure your uh, student, your teachers know where you're going. Um, you can't just like show up. You, you, we need to know where you are, but it's, it's really an awesome resource. Yeah, as Mr. Devone said, this is very important because if you're planning on applying to a school or have applied and that representative is coming to our school, they're going to be reading your application. And so you're going to have a visual. You're going to, how are you? I'm really interested in your school. That person will remember. Another indication of demonstrated interest, right? right? So they have a visual, they've met you, they have a sense of you. It's really important that you come, particularly if you're interested in that school. Exactly, yes. And, and you can ask any question you want. They're really, they're really great. Um, so yes, and you will be emailed a reminder about this. So, But definitely sign up. It's really worth it. They do track. They keep a record. They take attendance when you come in so they know who came. So it's really a good experience. So, Oh, if it's only, OK. Good point. Okay, so only if that college is on your list will you get the email reminder. So that's but a good point. I also send out to all parents a list of every college that's going to be vid visiting on a monthly basis. It's also on bulletin board outside, um, so you're going to be informed. It's in my newsletter, so yeah. And as always, if you're not sure, if you're, you're, your child's not sure, they can come talk to us anytime. Seriously, it's great. Just Or send us an email, it's fine. You know, whatever works. We'd love to help. So, final thoughts. You never thought we'd get to the end. Okay, so final thoughts. Um, so, you know, from your research, come up with a short list of 10 schools that interest you. Trim it down to, to six. I understand that feels a little scary. There's not enough insurance in there. What if you don't get in? I know. But the reality is you don't need to have 25. That's crazy. You don't need, you don't even, you know, you, you have to, you, if you do enough research, you're going to know what's going to work for you. You're going to, you know, find those schools that fit, and you're not going to need the 20 schools. So it's really important to kind of really know what you're looking for. Do your research now when you have time. You don't have to be stressed in the fall when deadlines are coming. So take your time. Do your homework now and look into the school's visit. Um, right, and tell us what you're doing. So, okay. Mr. Devone, I think yes? everyone needs to just take a few deep breaths. Well, they're going to fall asleep. Before we go, because I felt like that was a it's lot of information, no, and then we all can go home unless we have questions. Yes. But have, everyone just take questions? a few deep breaths. It's going to work out. We, we, we gave you a lot of information. But what if it doesn't work out? What do you do then? <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> all right. So take that some works. deep breaths, students. Uh, relax. You have us, your school counselors, to help you. You have a lot of resources. And we have, who's this girl in the front? We have Miss Malero here, oh, who's now who's that? in for Miss Karen. Oh, Miss Karen, that's right. <laughs> she had a baby. Okay, but Miss um, Malero's here. <laughs> she did. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that a secret? <laughs> oh. Anyway, congratulations. Yes. All right. Um. So, any questions? <laughs> Are there questions? questions? I can run the mic. Here we go. Is there a place on the on your website where it? helps with GPA calculations um, from numbers to 4.0 or what, whatever the um, case So, is. I mean, I have a, um, I think we all have a, like a chart hanging in our office. It's kind of like, um, but when they report their GPA to the schools, they're going to report it as is. So if it's a 92 point whatever, that's what they're going to report. It's on a 100 point scale. But if they want to calculate it's like 3.0 or 3.2, they can come in and ask us. We have we all have like a chart hanging in our office. Okay, I'm just thinking about that in terms of having a sense of what are appropriate schools, you know, based on what your GPA is. So, and they don't do it by numbers, they do it by... Well, Family Connection does it by actual percentage. Like okay, 81, great. 91, whatever it is. It doesn't do it by 3.1, 3.2. Thank you. Oh, how important is your GPA when it comes to looking out at college? Like so her question is, um, how important is it? Um, your grades in your courses, 
Um, they're going to look at each year and each course you've taken. So they're going to look at ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and then they will see your senior year courses. So I, see, I, I think it's more important to think about each year and show improvement and increase your rigor each year and do as well as you can rather than just focusing on, the, um, on just the GPA each year. So really focus on what the courses you took freshman year, the grade you earned in those academic courses, how you did sophomore year, the grades you earned, and then junior year, and then similarly senior year. And then did you, what was the trend? They're looking at trends. I know a lot of schools will go backwards, so they'll start with senior year, and then go look at what the program is, and then kind of go back, realizing that ninth and 10th grade sometimes are an adjustment for students to high school. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good luck.